We're thrilled today to have somebody from the West Coast. In fact, it's, except for Alaska and Hawaii, it's tough to get further away from New York than, uh, than Seattle. Um, but he's written a book which kind of we think about all the time. It's called Blaming China. It might feel good, but it won't fix America's economy. But it kind of, it's a theme of so many of the things we talk about in our programs here, which is where's the data? Where's the, where are the facts that can lead to these conclusions? And what this book really does is it explains why it is that Americans have chosen or our political leaders have chosen kind of to blame China for what's going on in the United States rather than trying to institute more difficult policies um, to fix what's wrong at home. Uh, and it's a book, it lays it out in really, I mean, it's a, it's a fun read. Some of the books we get are, are, are tough to slog through. This is not tough to slog through. It's a, it's a fun read. It kind of talks about a lot of the things that, that we think about. But it's wonderful to have you here. You have Ben's bio, so I'm not going to waste time to recite it. But um, it's a great read. It's great to have you here. Um, and we look forward to the discussion because one thing this book certainly is, is thought provoking. You read it in each page, you go, oh gosh, what should we really be doing? What does this really mean? Yeah. Um, but thank you. Welcome to New York. Look forward to hearing from you. Well, thank you for the invitation, Steve, and for the opportunity to speak at the uh, National Committee. It was, Steve was walking me around the offices, showing me these pictures of people of significant uh, historical import in the context of the U.S.-China relationship, and that's particularly humbling. And it's a moment where the type of education and the conversation that's happening at the National Committee in the context of the U.S.-China relationship is, is literally more important than ever. Um, I also want to make sure I say thank you to Margo and to Mark Bourget, who I believe used to work here and actually made the introduction. Years. Yes, yeah. and so I have to make a point of saying thank you to Mark, uh, who's now a vice president at NIAS in Seattle. Um, th this book is admittedly not always a happy read. Um, it was written in the immediate aftermath of the uh, two wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, the 2008 financial crisis, and what I characterize in the book as a reaction to President Obama, who for all of his uh, flaws and for all of the policy uh, disagreements that I think reasonable people can have with him, was simply not the leader that many people are characterizing him to be. And at the end of 2012, when I finished the first draft of this book, uh, what I was struggling with was why the United States was so economically anxious, uh, why the political dysfunction uh, had become such a pervasive part of the American consciousness, this awareness that at a very practical level, the U.S. political economy just didn't work for the American middle class for the American blue collar worker. And as I wrestled with that, it just became very obvious to me that something was very badly broken uh, in American life. And as you start to unpack that thought, that something is just wrong in American life, you very quickly develop the idea, the hypothesis, that one of two things can happen. The United States can either get very serious about hard issues that go to the quick of our ability to politically reform a system that is ossified, that's no longer focused on the right questions, or we can look for an external actor to blame. And so the question became very simple. Which did I think was more likely? Was it more likely that the American Congress or that a presidential candidate that at the end of 2012 was just an idea, just a figurehead? It certainly wasn't President Trump himself. Was it more likely that the American political system, as represented in Washington, D.C., would continue to be dysfunctional, continue to struggle with making very hard choices, or would we pivot and actually begin to think very seriously about China or some other outside actor as the underlying root cause of our problems? Once I had that basic hypothesis firmly in mind, the question was, in what ways 
could those insecurities be uniquely perverted and projected into China? Was China actually the best actor that could take on that emotional burden? Would they actually be the best country through which American anxieties could be projected? Blaming China at its core argues that while there are many problems in the U.S.-China relationship, there are many reasons not to blindly or blithely trust China. At, its, at our core, right now, the single most important thing that the United States needs to get right has nothing to do with the U.S.-China relationship. It has entirely to do with the political choices that affect our economy, our political system, things entirely within our control in Washington, D.C. Now, what are those four insecurities? Now, before I get to those four insecurities, I want to make sure I'm clear on some ground rules. Nothing in this book argues that China has it all figured out. As a matter of fact, my underlying conviction is that in three years, we're having a conversation about the Chinese economy where we are able to see that a, a lot of debt has accumulated, much more debt has accumulated than a market economy would have ever accommodated. And so I don't ever presuppose that the Beijing model has something fundamentally right about it that we've missed. There are definitely insights. I also never argue that there are not hard and difficult conversations that need to happen both on the commercial and on the political side in China. Commercially, we have to have very hard conversations about IP, about market access, about cybersecurity. On the political side, there are very real disconnects between how America, at its core, as a post-enlightenment uh, country that believes that free markets ultimately lead to free people, that believes in religious freedom, that believes in political dissent. These are not trivial disconnects. And it does neither country any service to pretend that these are not significant structural barriers to us working together in the future. I also believe that if America were to embrace these hard political conversations, there's no reason that we cannot have another era of Pax Americana, that we ultimately cannot have another 50 years of peace, prosperity, and stability. But that to do that, we have to have some very hard conversations about how we're doing business politically right now. So what are those four insecurities? The first and probably the most obvious is economic. Again, in the immediate aftermath of the 2008 financial crisis, it was common wisdom that the American economy didn't work for people. And we now see in the current administration a political moment that owes much of its gravitas to an ability to connect to a deep emotional truth in the part of the world, in the part of the country where I grew up, in rural Indiana, where people feel anxious about their futures. In the book, I talk about how this economic insecurity in some ways was inevitable at some levels. In the period after World War II, the US economy accounted for over 50% of all manufacturing globally. Why? Every one of our economic near-peer competitors had been leveled. Singapore, Japan, Korea, Germany, China, their industrial infrastructure was almost gone. And so when we hear people talk about making America great again, at some level, they're going back to a moment in time that was absolutely a historical anomaly. If we wanted to have the middle, American middle class be similarly confident in their futures, we needed to make much more explicit the job of the politicians that we sent to our state capitals and to D.C., that their single-minded focus needed to be on economic policies that ensured the stability of our working class, of our middle class. Politically, there was this profound anxiety, and I talk in the book about uh, being with a, a, a major GOP donor um, who on his private jet would uh, take the different GOP presidential candidates from different campaign events, and he would use that time to get to know them. And he, we were talking about at the time, um, he had taken Huckabee uh, somewhere, and we were talking about his particular economic policies, and this gentleman, not, not Governor Huckabee, but this particular uh, GOP donor was talking about a factory that he was building in China. And he was just talking with glee about how easy it was for him to get what he, what he needed to get done. He talked about how there was you know, some farmland that they needed and how quickly they got that farmland and they tore the houses down and they built that factory. <clears throat> 
And when he finished the conversation, I asked him, I said, well, what about as a conservative, as a disciplined conservative, what about your view on those individuals' rights, things like eminent domain? What's your point of view on that? He groused for a second, and he said, well, boy, they get results. And so this economic anxiety translated to a political anxiety where for, for all kinds of reasons, the Chinese system was perceived for the last 15 years to get results. And the American political system, which is characterized by dissent, which actually views disagreement as a necessary thing that gets to better outcomes, at the end of the day, wasn't. So our elevation of dissent as this great good actually wasn't being perceived as generating better results than a system that was ostensibly more authoritarian. <laughs> Where does that leave the American self-perception of our poli what makes us politically unique? Where does that leave us? Third insecurity that Americans were walking around with that I touch on in the book is, our, is what I'm going to characterize as foreign policy. Or to say it differently, what's our place in the world? One of the things Obama got a significant amount of grief for was this idea that he was somehow apologizing to the world. In the immediate aftermath of Afghanistan and Iraq, uh, his somewhat infamous now speech in Cairo uh, was perceived by many, many of his critics as apologizing for America. And the underlying disconnect there for many middle America, again, where I grew up in rural Indiana was, are we now apologizing? Are we no longer the world's hegemon? And if we're not the world's hegemon, then who are we? Can, can we still get our own way when we want to or need to? And that, was, that anxiety was expressing itself at a moment in time when China was embarking on these extraordinarily ambitious initiatives, the One Belt, One Road initiative as a good example. And again, unpacking whether that's ultimately going to be effective or not, let's set that aside. The perception in parts of the United States is that, Amer is that America had lost its way in terms of our place in the world, and China was stepping up and filling the gap. And the last insecurity, which, which is, I would argue, necessary for what I fear could happen to the U.S.-China relationship. The last insecurity is America's profound uh, fear over being safe. And, and let, me, let me unpack that a little bit. In the United States, our political system is at its best, and, and perhaps any political system is at its best, when it's not dealing with a shapeless and stateless threat, specifically the threat of terrorism. Our political systems are at their best when they can actually orient themselves against a near-peer competitor. And in the absence of a near-peer competitor, when a, a society feels deeply distressed, politicians' normal tendencies are going to be to try and find a near-peer competitor against which those anxieties can be packaged up and projected. So it didn't have to be China necessarily, but it would have helped if it was someone who has a carrier uh, a supercarrier, intentions to build one, and stealth fighters and things like that. It certainly helps package those anxieties and direct them. All of this in late 2012, early 2013, was perceived by many publishers as a little bit ridiculous. But the <laughs> book has been, in many ways, um, unfortunately, very predictive of the world that we're living in, uh, unfortunately. In, in the, at the end of the 2008 financial crisis, Steve and I were talking about this uh, before coming in here, uh, Nassim Taleb uh, wrote a column in the Financial Times. And he was talking about how uh, in, the, in the months after the financial crisis, policymakers who had more or less constructed the world that had imploded were given the keys to the kingdom yet again. And in that op-ed, he wrote something that has haunted me. He said, it's as if we have a tragic failure of imagination. So right now, right now, at this moment, uh, two years into the current administration, an administration that has made use of things like tariffs, which for most of the post-World War II era were widely accepted as the cause, one of the causes of the Great Depression, one of the things that made the Great Depression much worse and much longer than it needed to be. We are now actually in a moment where the current administration believes that to be an essential policy tool. 
that not only will that somehow create a new equilibrium economically between the United States and China, but that we can impose these tariffs without somehow unwinding the complexities of this current moment of globalization. My question to us all, and the question the book is attempting to wrestle with, is are we guilty of a similar tragic failure of imagination? Right now, the bulk of the question that we're asking ourselves relative mm -hmm. to the U.S.-China relationship is about economics. But economics ultimately lead to politics, and as Clausewitz famously said, war is politics by other means. And at what point does this stop being purely an economic conversation and begin to be one that is, is framed up as a traditional great power rivalry? And at what point does that framing inevitably take us back to some of the great power politics that were proven to be so dangerous in the 20th century? None of this is inevitable. I still believe that if the United States makes hard choices, if we embrace some very difficult reforms, if we get very serious about the type of industrial policies that are necessary to ensure that this remains the best place in the world to innovate for biotech, for high technology, for in IT, if we get very serious about that, the United States can enjoy another period of peace, of prosperity. But that can only happen if we challenge our leaders to not blame China for problems entirely of our making. Let me read you a paragraph from the book, um, which takes this argument to an unfortunate, but I think necessary, end. And in asking the questions in this last paragraph, what I'm trying to get to is, is the hu human hubris that many times in the past has characterized similar moments in time where people, where leaders were convinced that somehow this time was different, that somehow we could compartmentalize political dysfunction economic insecurity, underlying deep and pervasive anxieties, and prevent them from spiraling out of control, only to be proven wrong time after time. Let me read this, and then we can open up to question and answers. In the aftermath of every war, mankind steps back and wonders aloud how we can prevent such atrocities from ever happening again. We survey the national cemeteries, look at the wounded and the families left behind and demand of ourselves that we never let such a moment happen again. And yet it does. Again and again, men throw themselves at one another, equally committed to their cause and country, equally sure of the justice and righteousness of their actions. And every time as the heat of battle fades, we wonder aloud how humanity could have been guilty of such a moment of irrationality. Yet here is the deeper truth. War is always rational. It is always the sensible choice, as understood by the people who stand up and offer themselves at the altar of each generation's god of war. It is rational because their leaders understand two essential things about human nature. Insecure people need someone to blame, and blaming an outside actor is always the preferred choice, as opposed to dealing with deeper and more problematic structural issues at home. None of this is inevitable, and I would assume that most of us in this room are deeply committed to a healthy, if not challenging, relationship between the two countries. The underlying argument in this book, though, is that what we have to get right about the U.S.-China relationship has much more to do with choices entirely within our control than, cho than choices that will be made in Beijing. Let me stop there and open it up for questions. Yeah. There, there's a Well, your, your last sentence was actually my, my question, which is the book really talks about how these problems are generated by a U.S. political, a dysfunctional U.S. political system by the four anxieties that, that you talked about. Given that, what can the Chinese government do? Just sit there and say, well, we hope the patient gets better, but if it doesn't, you know, nothing we can do. There has to be more the Chinese government can do to make this right. So, let, can, I, can I say that differently? 
what's the deal that President Trump would say yes to that would make make him turn the temperature down on this relationship, right? Isn't that, I mean, let's just use the current administration's language. But I think the book lays out, a, I think the book actually lays out a persuasive argument that even without Trump, this happens. Yes. I, I think the book well, basically, it's not really about Trump, it's about America. And it's about the choices that America has made. So even if Trump didn't exist, would these problems exist? Yes, I mean, I, I the, the core of the book is the belief that Trump, the personality, was inevitable. Trump, the person, was not. I mean, if I knew that Donald Trump was going to be president, I would be doing something on Wall Street that would not require me to be writing books in my part time. <laughs> but, but, being able to predict a moment in time where it would be emotionally true to significant parts of the American populace that someone like Donald Trump was necessary to hit the Chinese back, to hit the multinationals back, that was predictable. And that is how we got, so, so the question you're asking is Donald Trump, does it, did it have to be Donald Trump? Of course not, it would have been someone. And the great fear that the book alludes to isn't Donald Trump. The great fear is someone who actually has what I would characterize as an organized worldview that brings together hostility towards China with real economic populism, with a real willingness to let that bleed into militarism. That's, that, we're not there yet. And again, me, and there's, every, and I, you know, we'll find out at the midterms, there's, there's a possibility that this is the wake up call in the, in the body politic in the United States that gets people to say, okay, this is, this is not the solution to the problem, and I want a different, type, a different type of politician who asks different questions, who forces me to wrestle with different complexities. I'm, I, I very, very much want to see that happen. I'm not sure that what's transpiring right now would suggest that that's probable. So back to my original question, what should the Chinese government be doing? Is the conclusion by reading this book the answer? Nothing. It's all up to the United States. I don't think that's the right answer. I don't think they can afford to be perceived by stakeholders in the United States as doing nothing. I also don't think that the <coughs> things that the that this administration is asking them to do um, are likely going to be enough to fundamentally change the conversation that's happening between Lighthizer and between his counterparts in Beijing. So I don't think that the Chinese actually have enough to offer D.C. I don't think that there's some sort of sweeping SOE reforms, um, you know, some sort of fundamental change to, be, you know, becoming more of a market economy that is within the reach of the Chinese leadership that would actually make this better in the short to medium term. You're sitting with top leaders in China. What do you tell them? What do you tell them to do? We need a, we need a, so let me, let me go back. Prior to, prior to the last couple of years, I've been spending a lot of time with the CFDA, the Chinese FDA, um, working very heavily on trying to show that harmonization of the Chinese FDA system to the global, um, it's called the GXP standards, is actually good for their domestic companies. It's good for their innovators. It actually allows them to have a chance of exporting innovation. The only thing that I think we can ultimately, in the short term, we can get the Chinese to agree to would be some incremental um, opening of, of key markets that are high technology in nature where we could show that by doing that, it would actually ultimately help them become more competitive. Beyond that, I'm not sure. Boy, that's a pretty depressing. That's a pretty trivial. That's not a, yeah. Uh, we, I see we already have some hands, all the way in the back. I can't see who that is. Hi, it's Irving Lee. I see that loudly. You, yeah. I think you're making a mistake in arguing that what China can do. I think the problem is here in the United States. Well, that's what the, the book argues. The United States is the one that's it's, it's, it's being antagonistic. They're the ones that are intervening in wars in the Middle East. And uh, they're obviously responding in an aggressive manner. I don't think China is responsible for this conflict at all. So I think whatever is done is done here in, at home in the States to stop the wars. But I just want to get back to the perspective of uh, the what's changed, what actually the basis of rapprochement 
initially was, of course, during the Cold War, was during the Vietnam War. And uh, that relationship has developed and obviously allowed China to, to grow as a consequence. And of course, part of that relationship is that China would not intervene in any struggles abroad. That was part of that rapprochement, that was thing, right? So what's changed? What's changed is that China is developing an economy, providing an alternative economic development system with the Belt and Road, right? And that's really what the basis of the conflict is, because you have, on one hand, U.S. foreign policy being very aggressive in the Middle East, very much a Zionist project for the most part. And then you have the Belt and Road, which is a, I see as a peaceful alternative in economic development. And this is you find these two, two positions in conflict. And you know, it seems to me that this, this tariff war is really more geostrategic than anything else. It's less about trade and more about trying to stop China's economic growth. And I don't know if you have any perspective of what the, how this is going to end, what it's going to lead to, or whether or not it's going to be successful. But I, I obviously think that the problem is here at home in the United States. So two questions. What, what, is, what has changed and what is the administration's goal? So, so what has changed? I mean, we're... I think everyone in here has enough subject matter expertise to, you know, know what China looked like in the late seventies and early eighties, right? So set aside the the triangulation against the Soviet Union, okay, which was significant, right? That was a significant part of the the real politique that led to a, a relationship between the United States and China. Let's just set that aside. Yet you're right. What's changed, I would argue, is that the Chinese system has proven to be the political system has proven to be much more resilient, and it has proven that the American aspiration of using mark, a market-based economy to spread democracy in China, was they could actually decouple that. Okay, so that, right out of the gate, that's extraordinarily destabilizing, because at the core of the American experience, our self, our self, our conviction of self is that you cannot be, you cannot have free markets and not have free people. And so, the Chinese, what's changed is the Chinese have actually figured out that there is a way to decouple that. There, there, that is not necessarily something that goes hand in hand. So that has changed. And then at the same time, in the book I argue that American, on both the left and the right, did this. Okay, they moved, they, everybody moved, the, the, the left moved to the center and the right went crazy. Okay, and I, and I say that as somebody who worked for Dick Luger. Okay, I grew up in Indiana. I met my wife at Senator Luger's election night party in 1996. I ran and won several college Republican races and haven't voted Republican in 15 years. Okay, because it became obvious to me about 15 years ago that the that the Republicans were move were just embracing what I characterize in the book as free market fundamentalism, and it, and and even it progressives and you know Frank Rich has written about this. Progressives have even moved to the center where the assumption was that, hey, you know, you're going to have to get it retrained, you're going to have to find a new job, you may have to move. Well, say that to, you know, say that to people in Plymouth, Indiana, who have a GED or a high school diploma and have been working on an assembly line, right? That, that, that was never honest. That was never an actual assessment of what would have to happen. So what's changed? China has closed the gap. And China's political system has delivered results at a time when there's a perception, maybe not entirely fair, but a perception that the American system hasn't. And so person to person, middle class person in China, middle class person in Indiana, working class in China, working class in Indiana, China has closed the gap by being able to convince people that tomorrow's going to be better than today. That your leaders, for all of their flaws and for all of their <laughs> corruption, they get up with a single-minded focus every day to make sure that the economy is getting better. And in the United States, especially at the, in, the, in the era of the Cold War coming to an end, the peace dividend, we, ha we were filled with hubris. And we embraced a particular type of political orthodoxy that said, people will figure this out. That same political orthodoxy right now is, is going all the way down to how we think about health care. We're, we're, we're still in this moment where we're, we're really wrestling with the role of particular perversions of what I would argue are Burkean conservative, real insights that conservative politics should have. We've perverted that, and China has just pragmatically, step by step, closed the gap at a time when a very particular type of free market fundamentalism here has prevented our ability to really create an organized system that delivers value to the middle class. 
So I think that that is the significant reason. The second question you ask, what does the administration want? <laughs> I have this weird timing. I was on Capitol Hill testifying the day that the $200 billion tariffs were announced. And that was one of the questions that we got asked. And I, I, I mean, this, this, the administration's motives at face value would be to restore some sort of economic parity between the two countries. I think when we look, when we hear the comments from Pence a couple of weeks ago, um, I think if we take Steve Bannon seriously, which I would suggest that we do, uh, when he talks about having a war in the South China Sea, and, and more or less you could swap out noun for noun and have someone in Germany in 1933 saying the same thing. I mean, I think we should more or less assume that there is, uh, there are additional goals around constraining China that are not purely economic. And again, I argue in the book, those are, those are deep insecurities that go to whether or not America has confidence about its position in the world, whether or not our model really is better and, and will work best from an av the average person's point of view. Right here, front, yeah. I was wondering if you could talk you about, uh, I'm John Hartman, I'm a member of the public, and I wonder if you could talk about dumping steel uh, not necessarily uh, as the in the U.S. China relationship, but as the China world economy uh, in the steel business. I, I should confess, I'm not. That's an area outside of my expertise. So I, I, I live in the world of artificial intelligence and and healthcare. So the steel subsidy debate is a little bit outside of my my worldview. I yeah would 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 hate to <laughs> go into an area I'm not comfortable speaking to. Um, on the um, American... Can you identify me? I can't oh, hear you. I'm, I'm Serena. I work for Fox News. Um, on the topic of, you know, the security, American confidence and security, I wonder, um, do you believe in a subsidies trap for U.S.-China relationship? If you do, how can we sort of like alleviate this kind of tension? What's the way forward? Dr. Allison, uh, who, who wrote the the city and trap, uh, the most recent interpretation of it, uh, read the book and sent me a note and he said, you caught something that most people don't pay attention to or, or don't, don't, don't think about enough, which is that w we are in a Thucydian trap, but it's not inevitable. But what makes it not inevitable has much more to do with us than with China. And so I, I, that, that was something I, I, I appreciated. Do I think that we're in something that approximates the Thucydian trap? Yes, I do. Um, I, 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 at a very basic level, I think we are a great power that is um, perhaps approaching <clears throat> what Schumpeter uh, saw and characterized as a moment of creative destruction where industrial societies become complex and top heavy and they implode and in the aftermath of that you have an opportunity to create something new, something good. My best case interpretation is that that's, that's what characterizes America for the next 10 years. We have our struggles, we have some really hard moments ahead of us, but we don't let those difficulties spread. That requires a type of political courage that I, yet, I don't yet see being exhibited. Um, so, so, do I think that we're in a Thucydian trap? Yes. Mm -hmm. I think it's escapable, and I think escaping it has much more to do with choices that we have within our control. And what do you say to the dragon slayers who argue China's action in the East China Sea, China's action in the South China Sea, China's restriction of access to its markets, China's tariff barriers, China's non-tariff barriers? You can, I can go on, it would take all the time we have left to go on the list of actions which the Chinese have taken, which have made this Thucydides trap worse. much worse. Yeah. So, so a, a couple of things. Um, right, right out of the gate, I, I presuppose that a rising power is going to be characterized <clears throat> by certain types of activities that will be an attempt to express confidence and an ability to control uh, one's local locality uh, in ways that they couldn't Right out of the gate. So, so not even talking about China. Any rising power, one of the characteristics of that rising power is going to be, let's just say, to flex a little bit of muscle. China has some particular insecurities of their own that make some of that muscle flexing um, perhaps not more understandable but more explainable. 
Okay, so that that none of that's to suggest that we should simply um, uh, whitewash those. Those are we need to have some very hard conversations about those things. I I at at my core though, I would argue that China's reforms on balance have been more progressive and led to a version of China that is better and has contributed more to the world's stability than we originally had hope had hoped for. So these are problems. These are hard things we have to talk through. And in, and in some cases, there is a version of the future where China could be so militaristic where the United States would have to counterbalance that with military force. I just want to be careful that we don't take the world toward to war, on a path to war, over some atolls in the South China Sea. That, that would, to me, to my way of thinking, be wildly asymmetric to the actual threat that that, that, that presents to the world that we currently inhabit. To be dancer, uh, just to play devil's advocate, I think there's a mounting voice, although highly repressed in China, thinking that the, despite the tremendous accomplishments in the past 40 years in terms of re reform and opening up, but in the past few years, uh, China has taken almost a, a bad face. And what do you think about that argument? And, and I think that plays into, I'm not talking about the outside pressure only, but within China, there are a lot of uh, discussions, particularly the anxiety about the privately yeah. owned uh, companies. And the second question is, uh, what do you think about the latest conversation that Trump had with uh, uh, Chairman Xi or President Xi? Uh, obviously, I don't know if you can read the TV. You know, no. how, did you, how did you see that? You know, the, any possibility of having a, at least a short-term ceasefire so the the first the, f the first question that you're asking um, and I'm going to betray some of my conservative uh, principles mm -hmm. if you will um, if I go back to Iraq and Afghanistan uh, conservative philosophy at its core uh, be begins with an acknowledgement that there are things that you cannot change for another person that there are things that the other person has to change on their own right. So if you take that value and you extrapolate it to foreign policy, the idea that America can change Iraq's political system, to me, was always doomed to fail. Okay, that, To me, that, that goes back to just some very predicate convictions that I hold. So if I take those convictions and I extrapolate them to China, I, I have a conviction that we have to be careful about how much about China's current reform trajectory we can really influence. So that's not to suggest that we don't have to argue that they are on the wrong track, mm -hmm. that the last, that really the last four to six years have been very disheartening, mm -hmm. that we see problems, and that many of those problems are going to make it untenable for us to continue to persuasively argue at the policy making level and at the popular culture level that a positive relationship with China is a good thing. So so I, I don't that is a really hard conversation and I see no reason for us to pull our punches there. I also don't think those are punches that we should throw in public, at least not yet. I think we would get a lot further in those conversations by trying to make sure that we're having them uh, in the in the place where they're going to land the most, which is not on Twitter. Um, so, so that, 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 so, and just to be very clear, again, I go back to something I said at the beginning. One of the underlying convictions of the book is that China has a lot of problems. Mm -hmm. I, I talk about in the book uh, striking up a written correspondence with a Christian pastor who was under house arrest. And it was a very deliberate attempt on my part to get out of the Potemkin village experience of being a businessman who's building a business in China. I wanted to make sure that I had at least some however clumsy, some line of sight mm -hmm. to what it was like to be a part of China that wasn't working. Mm -hmm. And not only wasn't working, but was under real, real persecution. And that was, an, that was an attempt to make sure that I understood and I had a holistic sense of China. So those, to me, the last couple of years have been distressing. They are very problematic. And, and there's a scenario, you know, to what Steve was asking, there's a scenario where China's own militarism, China's own nationalism, China's own political lack of reform and perhaps even reversal takes us on a path to war. That could happen. I just want to make sure that my country, where I do have the most control, 
is starting from a position of confidence and conviction that we are doing that with our feet firmly planted, having dealt with the significant structural problems that we have, that we have within our control. That for me is where it starts. And again, that goes back to this underlying conviction that we have to be careful about how much we can change for countries outside our own. Jan. You've said several times that you believe that, I'm sorry, Jan Harris <laughs> from the National Committee. Um, you've said several times that being stuck in this Thucydides trap and taking it to its worst end is not inevitable. There are things we can do. You have a half hour with Trump. If he were amenable to listening to outside <laughs> advice, um, give us your structure of what your top four things are that he has to solve first in order to, if he were willing to, to put us on a path that yeah. would make this a better and more even relationship. Is this specific to the U.S.-China relationship? <clears throat> it, it, it actually doesn't have to. Yeah. Be. I, I, my last, forget my last phrase. Yeah. What can he do to make us better? Um, <laughs> most important for ourselves. Tr 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 the, the, the fact that the question is, has to be framed to the current administration makes this hard. Because to my way of thinking, he embodies the, 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 the fundamental dysfunction in American political life. The, the lack of any perception of complexity, any desire to think about root causes, anything to, 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 avoid, you know, to not deal with structural, real structural inequalities that persist in American life. I, I made this, if yeah. you were in a mood to listen. Right. I'm having a hard time. I'm having a hard time there intellectually. Right. But you did say, it, you know, it's not just Trump, that it was inevitable to have someone because of yeah. what we were doing to ourselves. So let's say you have someone, it doesn't have to be Trump, someone who's willing to listen. How do you think we should go about changing ourselves? Yeah, so again, I'm going to fra phrase, uh, frame this as someone who grew up in very conservative politics, and I have my, I have my diploma to speak for that. Um, number one, we have to have a really hard conversation about tax policy in the United States. Number two, we have to have a conversation about um, why gains are being privatized and losses are being socialized. Number three, uh, we have to have a really hard conversation about how money is being allocated uh, in relation to services that are accessed by and necessary to the vitality of the American middle class and the American worker. So those, so those would be my first three. My fourth would be, I would, I would argue that if you look at the reform trajectory, and let's talk about healthcare. We've talked about globalization, let's talk about healthcare because they actually, uh, they're similar in terms of root causes and the thought process behind them. The progressive point of view on healthcare reform in the United States is actually that we're gonna stop thinking about people as patients and we're gonna start thinking about them as, as consumers. And we are going to move from, just like we moved from an, area of, an era of pensions to 401ks, in, in the next couple of years, we will move from an era of employer-provided health care to individual health care being purchased by the, by the individual that they can take around as they move employers. And progressives, by and large, will probably get behind this. I was with Anish Chopra a couple of months ago, who was o President Obama's uh, chief technology officer for healthcare.gov when that launched. And even Anish, who's a committed progressive, um, will talk about you know, his point of view on how political reform is going, to be, is going to be influenced by what happens in healthcare. And at its core, a very progressive person, when you listen to what's being said, is arguing for a very libertarian uh, approach to solving the problem. So the fourth thing that I would push on is this idea that, there, that the market and that libertarian orthodoxies are the only way for us to solve significant structural problems. I think that's a, a, a real uh, um, philosophical disconnect that's most extremely embraced by conservatives, but I think it's infected even progressive thinking. So those would, those would be my, my four things. The fifth thing is um, I would argue fundamentally for us to – uh, double down on our strategic investments. You can call that having an industrial policy. Um, but when we look at the, the, the monies that have been allocated towards like the NIH, uh, we're not even on inflation adjusted dollars, I think back to where we were in 2003. So those kind of, it, the more we bleed those investments, uh, the less likely it is that the American economy is going to be generating the sort of innovation that's necessary. 
Um, so those, those would be my five things. The other thing I would push on is election reform. <laughs> well, no, I, I mean, I think realistically, I think gerrymandering, which should be the first thing that we attack. Yeah. I'm sorry. Gerrymandering. Yeah. If the Thucydides trap is effectively inevitable, if America doesn't have the leadership to change what it does, is that the is that your conclusion then? No, I I, I hate the the word inevitable. Mm -hmm. I think inevitability is lazy. Mm -hmm. um, nothing again. I'm going to go back to what Dr. Allison said after reading the book. Nothing about this is inevitable. There are things that we can do that are within our control. They are hard, um, but they are within our control. Um, whether or not, in this particular moment, we have the willpower to make those decisions is is a different matter. Death. What's the saying? Death and taxes are inevitable. Um, that doesn't mean we don't pay our taxes, and it doesn't mean we don't go to the gym. Right? There are things that we can do to try and optimize for better outcomes. And this, this organization and the ground that you've covered, you've done that. And, you, and this, this organization has lived through, the U.S.-China relationship has lived through some very trying times. We were talking earlier about the, the, the period after Tiananmen. Yeah. There were really dark moments, and I, I believe we can get you through think, You think this is the darkest? I'm probably not the person to ask because I was in well, high Chris school. Chris has been around a long time. Is this the darkest? Chris, Chris Merck, who used to be the pre well, he's worked in China for decades and used to be the president of the American Chamber, and the chairman of the American Chamber in Beijing. Probably, I mean, after, after, the moment after Tiananmen was a, was a kind of crisis, and I, I don't think this is necessarily that kind of crisis, but I think the, the trends right now are extremely negative. And the interesting thing to me is the extent to which they are negative on the Chinese side. I could write your book with a focus on China. China, after the 2008 crisis, uh, was seized by a series of incorrect conclusions about the state of the world and their own capacity and drew incorrect conclusions. And what we, uh, we have not seen So we now have, in a certain sense, the Chinese equivalent to Mr. Trump. We have somebody who is a fundamentalist, who is overturning a lot of the aspects of uh, Deng Xiaoping's reform, including the collective leadership, including the term limits, and you know, a whole range of, of things. And that project ultimately is not going to be successful. It's not really addressing the economic and social needs. So I think the trends in China are very negative. The trends in the US are also very negative. But in some ways, um, I have more confidence about the U.S. because I think we are more easily self-correcting as a system. Despite political dysfunction, I think we're a little bit more self-correcting as a system than, than the Chinese have. So, you know, I, another way of looking at this, in fact, if I were going to write the book, I would look at it in terms of competitiveness. And the, the, the United States, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, will be a far more competitive Demography alone right. is an enormous factor. I mean, you can't do anything about that now, no matter what you do in terms of allowing people to have as many babies as they want. It still takes 20 years to grow a child, 22 or three years to grow an infant to some, somebody who enters the workforce with appropriate training. So they, they have locked themselves in to some very, very serious policy changes. I do not really see that there is a gap that has been closed with the United States. I really like, I wouldn't mind if you gave some context about that in terms of, you know, what, what were the figures you were thinking about when you say a, a gap has been closed. I do not think the Chinese government or the Chinese political system is really much more effective than ours. I think they have a political crisis underway which is as serious as ours. And in both cases, it goes to the leadership. It's 
very heavily driven by uh, by the person at the top. But the reaction in China, as this woman just said a few minutes ago, is not visible, but it's very present. If you go and you know talk to people quietly off the record, you you see a very strong reaction. Anything you want to say on that? Yeah, on the on the gap question, I the. <coughs> the what I'm what I'm arguing for isn't that the United you know the, the United States economy and the Chinese economy are somehow close to being at parity, right? That's that's the worst, you know that that's the worst kind of macroeconomic you know woo woo. That's that's not what I'm arguing for. What I'm arguing for is that if you look at the China of today, based on almost any economic metric, they have made progress. The perception in the United States is that not only have we not made progress, but that in many cases we've gone in the, in the opposite direction. We, people in this room, being deep people of subject matter expertise, can, can very precisely look at that and say, yes, but there's still a significant gap. You would still rather be middle class in the United States than you'd rather be middle class. You'd rather be the working poor in the United States than the working poor in China. I, I understand that. But, uh, but emotionally, right now, part of what explains, I argue, this moment in American political life is a perception that we are not, our leaders are not as single-mindedly dedicated to advancing the, co the economic cause of middle America and the working class as their counterparts are in China. That's, that's maybe emotionally true and factually wrong. Henry, you've been on this at this many decades. You think it's the lowest moment in the relationship? Yeah, I've been on this for seven decades, I guess. And um, I've experienced the two max, that I feel. Experienced what? Two max, the double max. A guy named MacArthur and McCarthy. And the origin of, of this comes from that. And many Americans don't understand that. That probably is probably going back two months. I'm trying to understand it, but I've been doing a lot of reading on this, really. When you consider the termination of the firing of MacArthur, that was my and the for crossing the yellow, uh, there were many people who thought that he should have gone in and the world would be different. And the adulation that he experienced and that was shown in this city, believe it or not, I was around for that, um, was sort of the, the, the seed of a lot of this. President Truman was around that. And then, of course, the McCarthy period, most people know what I'm talking about. Being a Chinese in America, even back then, was no picnic. And referring to what Chris has to say, where are we going? I'm afraid that um, uh, I, I talked to my Chinese friends in America that we have to be prepared to uh, at least. So you're afraid we're entering a McCarthy period directed against Chinese? Yes. That's a fair fear. Peter, you've been at this for many decades, too. Not as long as Henry, not as long as Chris. Um, Is this the lowest you've seen? Uh, I was around at the time in 89, but um, I think there is a fear right now uh, as far as the national world is going. But I think at the end of the day, I do think, I agree with you, that I think some of the gap has been closed. And I think that's also caused a lot of fear on the U.S. side, certainly with the administration um, in my prior life where I worked uh, for a different government, um, we started to see where the Chinese were surpassing in certain technologies uh, than the West. You see, you know, I give a classic example here, part of our dysfunction in the U.S. It took us 20, 30 years and $10 billion to build a mile of subway on the Upper East Side. Perry. And what did China do in that 10 years? And so I think that, you know, it, it, political discourse that we have today between the Republicans and the Democrats, um, I agree with your statement. If there's not that type of industrial policy that changes, whether it's on infrastructure, whether it's on technology and so forth, uh, the Chinese have uh, mastered, in a certain sense, um, those incentives to Chinese companies, or even the foreign companies, to come to China and invest and build. Seeing that level of uh, leadership here in the United States, and the leadership doesn't only come from one party, it's a two-party system. It comes from both sides. And 
so if we're not willing to recognize that, and we're not willing to change that, um, then yes, whether it's all the different predictions, whether China's going to surpass the United States in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, and different economic parameters, or even military and so forth, um, are valid concerns. Um, but I do think at the end of the day, the cooperation between both governments, both economies, so we've seen it at a people, the people level, at a business to business level, has yielded very fruitful results um, that have benefited both societies. Um, here in the United States, whether it's exporting our products to China, um, or whether it's taking advantage, taking advantage of uh, cheaper products coming in from China. China's economy has changed enormously, it's not just manufacturing GI Joes and Barbie dolls and so forth, it uh, now has cell phones that um, are surpassing the newest Huawei phone. If you're running out of juice on your phone, you put my phone next to your phone, we charge each other. You know, you don't have that in my phone today. So um, I do think that the administration is playing a delegate line and pushing the Chinese too far and not giving them a hai jiu xia, as we would say uh, uh, in Chinese, you know, stepping. Way to, step down. way to step down, way to back down. I think that's concerning. I'm worried about the cost of the rhetoric right now. And there, there are real costs already going on. There are friends of mine in China that are starting to move their factories uh, from China to Southeast Asia or other places in the world. So these costs and how we recoup and how we relationship rebuild so that inevitably it's the two largest powers and largest economies in the world, they need that. Um, to develop and to, to work together. So I'm worried about those costs. I, <clears throat> I wrestle with what, what we, what did we really, let's, let's assume that this moment at some level is grounded in some, something that's true, okay? This moment that we're in the U.S.-China relationship, let's assume that. What, what did we really get wrong? Okay, did we really, uh, er, 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 right? Because this kind of anxiety is only provoked when you think we got something really wrong. Did we get something fundamentally wrong in the U.S.-China relationship, or, or, what I argue in the book, did we get something wrong about how to run our domestic economy? That's a really important, really, really important question. I ask the, I ask early in the book, let's let's give the Dragon Slayers full control. Let's say from 1980 to today, the Dragon Slayers are in control. What what happens? Is China just a much bigger, more dangerous? less stable version of North Korea? What, what, is, what is, from their point of view, what is it that we got wrong in the U.S.-China relationship? Now, I, would, I think there's plenty of things that we could have done differently. We could have gated any number of free trade agreements in ways that would have protected labor here and there. There's, there's definitely things that we could have done differently. But I would also argue that America, by and large, has had its best and brightest dealing with the U.S.-China relationship from the very beginning. We've done a lot of really extraordinary things. We've built a really, really good relationship with China. We've done a lot of hard, necessary, good work over the last 40 years. And when we talk about being at this particular moment, I, I can't help but feel at some level we're asking the wrong question to the wrong people. It has much less to do with what we got wrong about China and much more to do with what we got wrong here. Well, why do you think it is that yeah, what always amazes me of these discussions about, you know, what we got wrong with China and what we got right with China is I guess there's only a handful of us who are old enough in this room who went to Vietnam during the war in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And since that we've established diplomatic relations, guess what? No American soldiers have died in Asia. That's an incredible statement. Given the prior 40 years, hundreds of thousands died. And that's a product of the establishment of diplomatic relations with China because we reached an agreement of how Asia was going to run. And yet there's no discussion. There's just discussion now of further militarizing. And you're quite right when you say this. Uh, some atolls in the South China Sea. If you're a mother or a father, is it worth having your kid die over those atolls? I think that question is not being discussed. 
So not only is the political system dysfunctional, but discussions of the real issues are not occurring. Or the real consequences. The real consequences. Right, so, 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 so why? So, why? So, so, so this is um, this is something that I was talking with with a, with a colleague not too long ago, which is you know again like one of the cons so so. P what I call panda huggers, like panda huggers have some hard questions that they have to answer in terms of how we would have handled the U.S.-China relationship differently. But Dragon Slayers also have to, I mean, the Steve Bannons of the world, what they are going to be held accountable to is if they get their way and this conflict has to happen, they have to be held accountable for that. Mm. Okay, so, so by all means, by all means, let's argue over the things that we got wrong in the U.S.-China so relationship. So kill me and you're going to be accountable for killing me. Well, <laughs> that's kind well, of well what, but, but if Bannon is going to argue that we, I mean, this is, this is I think, the literal, the actual quote, it, we might, if we're going to be at war with China in the next 10 years, we might as well go to war with them now. I mean, that literally, literally you could take that and parse that differently and have that come out of the Habsburg Empire in their fear over Russia. In the in the in the years in advance of World War One, it takes <clears throat> it takes no imagination, zero imagination to say that's an act, absolute historical adjacency, and that's happening right now. That's the moment that we're actually in. So you know, the, I think that the, the the challenge to the dragon dragon slayers of the world is okay. If what you want is the policy set that we embrace. You have to be willing to live with the consequences and be held accountable to that. I just have one. Uh, by Peter and then Margo, and then we got somebody in the back, and then All we're right, going to so run one, out of time. One quick question. Um, Speak loudly, Peter. Do you take any solace that there's a possibility that at the end of the day, it's still, and these are my own views, not my institutional views, but be careful what I say here, uh, that it is the political objective this administration, which by any administration is pretty much to get a second term, um, that whether it's post um, midterms or whether this runs its course to 2020, to be able to say that you need me to deal with the Chinese, and that when it's politically advantageous to him, despite whatever the costs are, which I think every retail and business association has lobbied against the tariffs, and the hawks in the White House have clearly been the ones that have won the argument for right now, um, that a deal will get done in that context. I suspect a deal is going to get done on the other side of a 1,500 point drop in the Dow. That, that's my, my underlying conviction is, is when he needs it, right? I think it's right now politically useful to be perceived in parts of the country where he is strong, where his base is asking for this. I think at the moment at which multinationals and the broader economy starts to suffer, this will change. And there will be some very cosmetic, um, yeah, there'll be something that happens which will allow Declare a rationalization. Be, that's right, home. that's right. There will be the, you know, the, the E2 will land on the deck of the Nimitz and it will be mission accomplished, right? There'll be the economic equivalent of that, right? Marga. My question is, I'm with the National Committee, Margo Landman. <clears throat> My question gets back to your many pages in the book and your comments this evening about the dysfunction here. I didn't read and haven't heard how we get from where we are now to a more, a healthier place yeah. here. So the book, the book was written as a prophylactic and in an attempt to be prophetic. And at the end, again, at the end of 2012, as I said early on, this was, I mean, I, you know, I said David Brooks' agent was like, this is, if this is right, it's wildly too early. And so at the time I wrote it, the, the, you know, these, I mean, anyone who's written a book knows it takes a couple years for these things to get to market. You know, there was a publisher who was willing to take a risk on, at the time, what was kind of an outlandish hypothesis, which was that it was going to be the United States that actually had the potential to destabilize the modern global era, hmm. right? The idea that conflict in the U.S. and China wasn't, wasn't, was possible is not a new idea. But the, the idea that the United States 
could actually, in a moment of extraordinary dysfunction, be the one to do that was just not something most publishers thought was worth talking about. And then 2016 happened, and all of a sudden this made a lot more sense. Mm -hmm. So as originally conceived, it was an attempt to be a prophylactic against a moment that I feared was coming and that, in fact, happened. That is definitely the, one of the flaws in the book. One of the flaws in the book is not much more explicitly landing a message that says, here's what the United States needs to do. The last chapter lays out kind of two paths, and it characterizes the things that the United States should do, some of which are very personal. <coughs> some of which, had, you know, the book talks about, you know, not consuming outrage. I loved walking by a bookstore today and seeing that um, Glenn Beck's new book is about something along, like, don't consume outrage. I thought, how, how lovely for somebody who's been peddling you dope for 20 years to say you should really stop that dope. It's like your teeth, your skin doesn't look good, like you should stop. You know, but buy my, you know, one more hit, right? One more hit. Um, so, I mean, there, is, there are things in the book that are trying to land a message of here's what we can do on a very personal basis, on a structural basis. But if I was going to write the book now, I would be much more um, reductionist in saying here's what I actually think needs to be done uh, that both parties could bring to the conversation that would be things they could agree on. Miles. Miles Matthews, just as a point of information, the Second Avenue Tunnel is more than 10 years old. Yeah. It was started by Mayor Lindsay, and when they went bankrupt, <laughs> they had to stop construction. There are people living in the tunnels in East Harlem right now under mm -hmm. the, what was originally the Second Avenue Tunnel for over 40 years. Wow. Oh. Fascinating. In the back. I thought I was the only one who was going to depress people today. <laughs> <laughs> uh, at, at Brick Chang, uh, Cornell University. Um, so I really resonate with your understanding of anxiety and optimism in China and Hong Kong, uh, in, in China and the U.S. Because I, I grew up in Hong Kong and also grew up in Missouri, ah. suburban Missouri. So I see both sides of the coin really clearly. So I have two questions. Uh, first, are there any firm historic parallels you see that we can learn from about the great power struggle, such as late 19th century rise of Germany and the British anxiety about shipbuilding there, or early 20th century Japan and the U.S. reaction to imperialism there? And more relevantly, what do you think us younger people can do who are caught in between all of this? Because us Chinese Americans, we're going to be the ones that will have to deal with the fallout of this anxiety and fear and all those things you talked about. The, la the, last <clears throat> the last thing that you just said cuts me to my heart. I have a lot of you know, very, very dear uh, Chinese friends, Chinese American friends. And I live in Seattle now, which is you know, very influenced. Uh, by China, um, Chinese culture is, you know, a very common part of the experience of being in Seattle. And I think about on my 30th birthday, at the time I was living in Indiana, and my friend who's Korean, uh, which, you know, most of us would be able to tell the difference, but to a group of rednecks that were driving by as we were having a beer on my 30th birthday, felt like they needed to scream some racial epithets at him just to express themselves. I worry about war, for sure. I worry about what could happen to my friends. I look at some of the, thinking of one very dear friend in particular at a mixed marriage. I worry just, what, 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 do, what could this all mean? The question that you're asking is what you can do about it. And I don't want to give you a trite answer, but you have, we have to be involved. We have to have, make our voices heard. We have to challenge our politicians and the political system that we all inhabit to not accommodate cheap answers to really, really expensive questions. More so than any other group of people at any other moment in time, we have more influence over our future than anyone else ever has. So I still believe that we can change the trajectory of this conversation. But it requires us to stop consuming outrage. It requires us to make a very intentional decision to hear what other people are saying, to really think about the people who support an administration that many of us find very challenging. What is it about their lived experience 
that makes that particular expression of their politics right. It's very hard. People believe what they believe for a reason, and a lot of times there's something true at the core. So understanding that, having those conversations with those people is more important now than it ever has been. The, the first question that you asked, which is you know, the historical parallels, I think you pretty much got them, <laughs> unfortunately. I think those, when, my, when I think about the moment that we're in and the closest analogs over the last 150 years, those are what come to mind for me as well, uh, which is part of what makes the underlying uh, hypothesis of this book problematic. Uh, because I think that these are very similar structurally, uh, which, which, is pro which is a problem. That is, I, I would say the, the first part of the answer was the perfect ending <laughs> to the program. The second part, less optimistic, but it's, it's the book is available for sale outside. The author is going to stay a few yeah. minutes to sign the books, but thank you so much. This has been a very interesting program. <laughs> Great.